Yeah, well, thank you very much for letting me come hang out in the three manifold world and for coming. Um, so I guess I should start with the uh, definition of an orderable group, even though everyone knows it. So uh, so say that G is left orderable, except I won't because it's equivalent to being right orderable. Um, if it has a linear order, which is invariant under the group action, so A less than B implies GA less than GB. So I, I think this was an obscure corner of group theory until recently, but now uh, apparently has something to do with three manifolds. But uh, key ingredient of that is, uh, I guess I can put it here, which works from right to left. Uh, so orderability is related to existence of taut foliations. Here's a, a theorem by some organizers. Which gives a relationship. Um, so if M is a rational homology three sphere, they showed. Um, with which has a taut foliation, then uh, pi 1 of m has a finite index subgroup which is orderable. should uh, for inventing the universal circle action. OK. Uh, and I guess I want to just talk about a three manifold being orderable if its fundamental group is. Oh, yeah, it's, it's an explicit finite index subgroup, yeah. Uh, <laughs> OK, cyclic. Finite index. Um, I mean, it's not necessarily the whole group, though. Um, yeah, so, um, OK, so it's also the case that taut foliations are related to floor homology. So here's the. Uh, model theorem, I guess, for this. Um, if I take a, a Q homology three sphere, uh, 
I better make the definition first. <laughs> uh, sorry. So uh, here's a, a definition due to O's, Bas, and Sabo. Uh, so uh, I guess I'm always talking about Q homology three spheres in this talk. Uh, so uh, an L space uh, means that to be an L space means that the floor homology is minimal. So uh, minimal rank, so that rank of the floor homology equal to the order of the homology. And I mean they also proved that this is the minimum. So these are supposed to be the simplest manifolds with respect to floor homology and L spaces, uh, lens spaces are examples. And then um, it's a, a fact that, so I think this is also due to them, um, so if, if this Q homology three sphere has a taut foliation, then it is not an L space. So I, I think it's a, a question that apparently they asked. I don't think they stated it as a conjecture, but there's a, a question um, is the about the converse. So I, I guess, um, you know, inspired by these two theorems, uh, there was a, uh, a bold conjecture made. It was uh, Boyer, Gordon, and Watson. And so they um, were willing to make the conjecture that <laughs> M is orderable if and only if M is not an L space. Uh, um, sorry, Q homology three sphere. These are always Q homology three spheres. And I don't think they said it was irreducible, or I don't think they had to say that it was irreducible. But I mean, orderability is preserved by connected sums, and so is L space, not, not L spaceness, <laughs> but maybe they did state it for irreducible. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, I, I guess if you were to, well, I, I call it a bold conjecture because it, I, I guess there are certain people who think it's unlikely to be true, but it seems to 
have resisted all of their attempts to produce counterexamples, even though we have lots of ways of generating examples. Um, that would be Nathan. <laughs> Um, but if you were to take this conjecture and assume that the answer to the question was yes, then I guess you would be actually saying that um, orderability is the same as having a taught foliation. Both of those things, I mean, for these, let's be sphere useful Q homology three spheres, uh, the non L spaces would be described the same by both of those properties. So, um, what I wanted to talk about today was uh, sort of, so I mean, there, so let's take that as evidence that there's a close relationship between having a taut foliation and having orderable fundamental group. So, I, I wanted to discuss a sort of different type of uh, relation between these two things. orderability and not being an L space. And I'm, I'm really, um, well, and having a taut foliation. And I'm, I'm really looking here at um, Manifolds obtained by Dane filling. Of a homology circle. So not complements in homology spheres. I want to consider doing Dane fillings on those and understanding whether the fundamental groups are orderable. So, so here's a, a sample theorem, which uh, has extra technical hypotheses, presumably extra. Uh, but uh, let's suppose we have one of these. So I just want an orientable homology circle. The, it's a not complement, really. I want the boundary to be a torus. And then I want to, um, or I have to make some assumptions here. So let me assume that um, M has no closed and compressible surface. And I want to assume that when you have bounded incompressible surfaces with longitude boundaries, um, that it's a fiber. Finally, I want to assume that the Alexander polynomial um, 
has a simple root on the unit circle. And then the conclusion is that uh, there's some real numbers, uh, a less than 0, b greater than 0, such that when I do Dane filling on m, uh, with coefficient r, I get an orderable manifold for all uh, slopes between a and b. So there's a, a whole interval around the longitude filling, which consists of oh, the longitude filling is also orderable. Uh, but you get an a, a interval around the longitude filling consisting of orderable manifolds. Uh, all of them, probably, I mean. <laughs> But they're, I mean, some of them are probably more easily removed than others for other theorems. But yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, so I guess I want to say, uh, actually, what this has to do with being a taught foliation. So this is, there's an indirect connection here between being uh, taught, having a taught foliation, and this result. So uh, that comes from the following theorem. Rachel Roberts and Tao Li showed almost the same statement for the other property. So they have, uh, I guess they were assuming that M is a, a not exterior in the three sphere. And then uh, their result is that there's an interval such that this Dane filling has a co-orientable taut foliation. all are in the interval. So we're seeing the same kind of behavior anyway, although there's not a, a direct connection between these. It's fine for the not to be fibered. Oh. Oh, no, I have to assume that, even for fibered things, yeah. Well, um, it's not necessarily in the homology class of the fiber. You know, you can have surfaces that are longitude boundaries, but there are more than one of them. So, I mean, those things exist, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, I, I should mention a little bit about connection with L spaces here, I think. So, um, without having to know anything about floor homology, we can read some properties of L spaces in the literature, uh, which are related to this. So uh, uh, if so I guess I'm now I'm thinking about a not complement. Um, I could use the filling of M, I guess, but uh, it's more natural to talk about a not complement. So if this not K has an L space filling, Of course, this is a 
another uh, Osvath Zabo theorem. If you have an, if a knot has an L space filling, then it's Alexander polynomial. Well, it's Alexander Laurent polynomial, which is symmetrized um, up to sign, looks like this. It starts with one, and then there's a minus it that way. There's a, the next coefficient on either side of 1 is negative 1, and then the next coefficient is positive 1. So all, all the coefficients of the Alexander polynomial are 1 or minus 1, and they alternate. So this is uh, part of the strong connection between the Alexander polynomial and the core homology. So uh, that's actually turns out to be related to this hypothesis here. So there's a, a theorem we found. I mean, found in math Sinet. <laughs> It's a theorem of Convolina and Matash, and it um, is really kind of expanding on some Fourier analysis results of Boas from the 1940s. And uh, what they show is that if you have an integer polynomial, which is a palindrome, Alexander polynomials are, of course. Uh, let's say, write it as a normal polynomial, though, a sub i e to the i. Um, if it satisfies the, co the uh, condition that, the, that 2 times the absolute value of the middle coefficient is greater than the constant term, uh, then there's a root on the unit circle. So when you're trying to understand the connection between L spaces and, and orderability, um, this doesn't look like such a horrible assumption to be making. At least there are going to be such roots. Um, although, you know, you can, well, they're not necessarily simple, unfortunately, but I guess we checked sort of a few thousand randomly selected polynomials that have this property and factored them. And uh, it seems that if they have multiple roots, they're always roots of unity. But there's no theorem in the literature that proves that. Yeah. Right. So, okay. So I should. Well, no. Um, yeah. Let me mention one other fact here. No, I mean what we're what we're getting in the theorem is we're getting a, a range of slopes near the longitude which are orderable. And if the conjecture were true, well, let me, let me just mention this. I'm not quite sure what the correct attribution is, uh, but there's at least a theorem by Rasmussen now which implies th this statement. Uh, if K, this is a not an S. Well, he doesn't re even require it to be a not an S3, but let me just say it is. Um, if it has an L space filling, then uh, the set of all L space fillings uh, it 
looks like all the numbers which are bigger than 2g minus 1, or all the numbers which are less than 1 minus 2g, where g is the genus of the knot. So you expect to see the L space fillings being a, a cone that starts at, at 2g minus 1 and goes to infinity, or minus 2g minus 1 and goes to minus infinity. And then you might expect, if you believe the conjecture, that everything else would be orderable. And we're saying there's a little wedge inside the correct place where they are orderable. Yes, thank you, definitely. <laughs> yeah. All L space fillings is a, a closed cone going from 2g minus 1 to infinity or flipped over. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Any other comments, questions? They are fibered, yes, but um, we still have to rule out the possibility of these weird longitude slopes. Yeah. So is it a correct uh, combination of your statements on the board that if we don't have those things that we're going to need in the circle, then we don't have any L space things at all that we have? No. Um, no, there, there, I'll say a little bit more about that, too. No, they're not the same. And I mean, um, I, I don't know if, yeah, no, they're not necessarily the same. Right. <laughs> they, should, they should be, you know, 2g minus 1 and infinity, or the other, or, yeah, opposite from the one that you get, the lens spaces. Okay, so. Um, Let's see, I need to say a bit about character varieties next. I mean, I guess I can say this to begin with. I mean, there's um, there are quite a few papers coming out recently that are proving that groups are orderable. And sadly, they all <laughs> use the pretty much the same technique, uh, which is to construct an action of this group on the circle, lift it to an action of the group on the real line, and then it's kind of an obvious fact for any group that if it acts faithfully on the real line, it's orderable. It just pull the order back from the real line. And the only uh, constructions we seem to have so far for finding interesting actions on the circle are by looking at representations into SL2R, and then you take that, or PSL2R, acting on the circle, and try to use that to construct the ordering. Uh, and well, as you'll see, that's not going to be good enough to resolve the <laughs> conjecture, um, but um, that's also what we're doing. So I, I need to just give some notation about character varieties. I'll just I'll write R for the representation variety. Could be any space. I guess I'll call it N for any. And uh, X for the quotient by conjugation. Taken in the GIT sense, which I've recently learned means geometric invariant theory. I thought it was a place where you got software. <laughs> um, and these are affine algebraic sets. And then I guess I'll write uh, subscript R 
to mean, uh, so th these are algebraic affine sets defined over R. So you can talk about complex conjugation as a natural operation on them. And so you can look at the uh, fixed set of this thing, bar, I guess I should call it. Those are the real characters. They take real values on all elements of the group. And um, that means that uh, they're either SU2 representations. Well, maybe I should put a bar here, actually. So I, I want to look at um, like a smooth model of this a smooth projective model of the function field of the character variety and do conjugation there. So if you think of it that way, then you'd have SU2 representations, which are all that way, and you'd have SL2R representations, and then you'd have some ideal points, possibly, which are not affine. Well, and I guess I'm really thinking here about the case when the dimension of each component of this character variety is one, which uh, actually happens because of these assumptions. So, yeah, so I guess uh, no closed and compressible surface. Tells you that uh, every irreducible component has dimension one. And um, in that case, you know, you can see topologically what this real set is. So it, you're just looking at the complex conjugation on this smooth surface. So the, the real set is uh, a union of embedded circles in the curve. Um, and then when you add in the other hypothesis, so uh, no non-fiber longitude surfaces, that tells you that, um, for example, the, that the function which sends each character to its value on the longitude um, has a pole at each ideal point. So these circles don't pass through any ideal points. Okay, now one more definition. natural to look at the character variety of the torus being the boundary of this three manifold. So I just want to record that uh, in the character variety of the torus, there's an irreducible component coming from diagonal representations. let's say. Um, so the, the diagonal representations is a copy of 
C star cross C star. And inside of there, there's a canonical torus. Ian told me I'm supposed to call it a Clifford torus. Um, and I guess maybe you put a double T on it. Um, and so uh, when, you, when you pass from the representations to the character variety, um, you get D by taking the quotient Inverting the two elements, so uh, one over z, one over w. So this involution acting on c star cross c star gives you the characters of the diagonal representations, and then in the torus, um, when you divide out by this, uh, you get something that I want to call p, the pillowcase. So it's uh, the copy of a two-sphere with four singular points. And so just so that I've defined everything that appeared in the title of my talk, uh, the PE character variety of M is defined to be the pre-image under the restriction map. So I goes from character variety of M to character variety of the boundary. So you take the pre-image of the pillowcase, and that's what I'm calling the PE character variety. So inside of that pillowcase, you have the image of the SU2 representations, which is kind of a standard object for people to draw pictures of when they're doing gauge theory. Um, let's see. So maybe I, I have a list of uh, properties maybe I should just write down here. I'm sorry? Oh, what does the PE stand for? It's not physical education, right? Um, generically, a point here is peripherally elliptic. The, the eigenvalues are on the unit circle, so it's mapping to it. Uh, the eigenvalues of meridian and longitude are on the unit circle. So it stands for peripherally elliptic. OK, so just some, a quick list things to say here. Uh, the, the SU2 character variety is inside of it. Um, if you take the, the SL2R character variety is not inside of it, but um, you can define this thing, which would be the intersection. So both of these is some family of arcs and circles in the pillowcase. You can have circles that contain an, a circle in the PE character variety, which contains an arc of SU2 representations and an arc of SL2R representations, for example. Uh, if you intersect these two things, Um, that can only happen for reducible characters. Points in the intersection have to be reducible. Um, and then, yeah, there are no ideal points because of our assumptions. And uh, there's some one last thing. 
you could look at the PE characters and uh, the real characters. And the PE characters are a bit larger, in possibly. So um, there are characters which happen to be real on the meridian and longitude, so they project into the pillowcase, but they're not SL2R and they're not SU2, and I, we call them uh, X characters. And you'll see why. Uh, so I, how about some examples? Um, I have examples here. Let me do screen down, lights off. Unmute the display. <laughs> so let me just compute a couple examples for you. Um, I guess the figure eight. Okay. Uh, we're challenging the technology here. So I was going to start with the figure eight knot. Um, that's a picture many people have seen already because in this case, in the case of the figure eight knot, the PE character variety is actually entirely SU2 characters. Oops. So this is just to show you that it's what you expect. So I've actually, the, the dots on this uh, picture are the representations that we've actually calculated, and we joined them. Uh, and they're shown as dots because they're SU2 representations. So of course, it gets more complicated. Um, but maybe let me just do the 237 knot next. Oh, and I should explain what's in this picture. I'll do that in the next case. Okay, so uh, what this picture is, it's a rectangle divided into two squares, which you're supposed to fold along the middle to get the pillowcase. and for some reason, which I can't explain, was a big mistake. Um, I did this in the non-standard coordinates. So uh, on this side, you have the eigenvalue of the meridian. And on this side, you have the eigenvalue of the longitude. Um, and then the, the dots in this picture are representations that we can calculate. And uh, the missing legend would tell you that uh, if it's an SU2 representation, it might be easier to see if I just blow this up. Uh, sorry. Zoom to rectangle. Uh, the diamonds are SL2R representations, and the dots are SU2 representations. So you have, in this PE character variety, you have this family of arcs. They uh, start and end at singularities of the two sphere, so those are where traces are plus minus two. And so up in the torus, those would be curves instead of arcs. And um, they divide into those two parts. And I mean, just as a, as a hint, uh, if, you're, if you're interested in whether a certain Dane filling has an SL2R representation, then you're asking, the question of whether a PQ curve on this pillowcase is crossing through this stuff so that we can calculate these things. 
Um, the colors are, yeah, that's kind of esoteric. So uh, it, this computation is, is done by looking at a certain branched cover, and the covers actually, the colors correspond to components of the pre-image of the unit circle in this branched cover. So it's not too meaningful um, by itself. So I don't know, just to, just to do sort of a typical, not too complicated example, uh, here's a random, more or less random knot that I picked out. Takes a bit longer, but we've carefully designed this software to take as long to do a computation as you can stand and not be any faster than that. It takes a bit longer to actually decide whether a representation is into SL2R or SU2. Uh, so they tend to get fairly complicated. Um, these, you tend to have these kinds of uh, circles where all the representations are in SU2, and then sometimes you have arcs of SL2R representations, typically like this one, ending at a parabolic. So, just one more, uh, or maybe two more here. Uh, let me try 10, 136. Do they, sorry, do they tend to be what? Uh, not sometimes and sometimes not. They, they, yeah, no, they, they often have multiplicity more than one. Um, okay, so this is a fairly complicated one, but uh, I'm showing it to you because it has X representations on it. I can answer your question about the multiplicity at the same time. So yeah, so here uh, you can see these are X representations. So sometimes you'll have arcs of SL2R representations, like here, which then uh, turn into representations which are real just on the peripheral subgroup, but not actually real everywhere. And then they might switch over to SU2 representations. And I, I guess w what you're seeing in this particular case, um, the, the arc of X representations is double. It's a two to one map. And uh, the picture looks sort of like this in the, in the, in the character variety. Um, let's say we have this annulus embedded in the character variety and complex conjugation is reflection in that dotted line. Uh, you might have an arc of SU2 representations here and an arc of SL2R representations here. And then um, X representations on two arcs like that. And it's a, this is a twofold branched cover. These would be branch points when you map it down into the pillowcase. And so these uh, right angles here become 180 degree angles. And the two SU2 representations fold over on themselves. So they're mapped two to one. And then the X representations are mapped two to one. And the SL2Rs fold over. So that's, that's sort of the, the bad picture of a degenerate place like this. Yeah, so the typical transition from an SU2 representation to an SL2R representation occurs when the eigenvalue of the meridian is a root of the Alexander polynomial on the unit circle. 
So this has been analyzed by lots of people, uh, most recently uh, Heusner and Quarty. And the situation is that um, if you try to find an a reducible non-abelian representation that amounts to um, solving for roots of the Alexander polynomial. Mm -hmm. That's an old result of Durham. And then they show that those, irreduci those reducible non-abelian representations deform. So started with uh, Froman, I think, and uh, Kassen, uh and co-author, anyway. Kreinberg. Sorry? Kreinberg. No, um, Froman's paper uh, it was Klassen. It was Froman and Klassen, and I think uh, Berge, the, the German Berge, also had results like this. Anyway, that's, that's the typical transition. If you start with this uh, reducible non-abelian representation coming from a root of the Alexander polynomial, then you typically have SU2 and SL2R representations that are deformations of it. And um, you can actually prove that in the case when the root is simple because the, the dimension estimates for the, the tangent space, the Zariski tangent space to the character variety is expressed in terms of cohomology with coefficients in the Lie algebra, and the differential is the Alexander matrix. And then you have the reducibles sort of created by solving for the Alexander polynomial being trivial. And when things work out, you can show that you have these two arcs. Um, okay, so for understanding this theorem, uh, it would be better to have a different sort of picture. Uh, so let me just, I'll show you some of those, but let me just say what it is first. So uh, I want to show you some translation diagrams. What we're going to be doing here is take an arc of SL2R representations and uh, sort of standardize it so that, so these are SL2R representations in the PE character variety. So that means that the meridian and longitude are being represented as elliptic elements. And so if we take the meridian to fix the, the middle of hyperbolic space, in the standard model. So it's actually just a rotation. And then the longitude will also actually be a rotation. And then uh, you can look at that action on the circle that comes from that subgroup of SL2R. Uh, and those always lift because the obstruction is a cohomological one which vanishes for a knot complement. And so you're looking then at actions on R where the rotation angle of the meridian becomes the translation of the meridian on R, and similarly for the longitude. And then, uh, so, so we're going to graph, so we're, you can make the assumption, okay, so we lift to SL2R tilde, and we may as well so after normalizing, and we may, y you have choices in how to lift, so we can do this so that the uh, meridian translates by something, so that the translation of the meridian <coughs> is between zero and one. And then you can calculate the translation of the longitude and draw the graph. So I want to show you some of these uh, translation pictures. And in the, in the translation picture, then, if you want to ask whether a certain Dane filling has an action on R, 
you're just intersecting a line in the plane with the family of arcs that we construct here. So let me see if I can get those. Okay, so here is a, a translation arc picture. And let me tell you what's in here. So these uh, colored arcs, the coloring again, ignore. Um, those represent translation of meridian, which is on the x-axis now, and translation amount of longitude, which is on the y-axis. And here is the origin. And if I draw a line of slope negative r, it would appear on this picture to have slope positive r in the calculus coordinate system. But in ours, it would, uh, so th the slopes are reversed. And then when any intersection between such a line and one of these arcs is uh, going to give you an action on r, so that group will be orderable. So you look at this picture, and you see that there's a little range of lines through the origin which cross the diagram. And that's giving you the translations, I mean the uh, representations into uh, SL2R tilde. Uh, so a bit more data here. Um, when you see a red dot on this line, so this is, uh, this line corresponds to longitude translation zero. So those are reducible representations on the green line. And then you can ask, what's the translation amount for the meridian? That's going to be a root of the Alexander polynomial. And if it's simple, it's a red dot here. Um, then there are these orange and white dots on the side. And um, I can explain those in a second. But uh, what those tell you is uh, uh, something about real places of the function field. So uh, I have to state another theorem, I guess. And so maybe I should do that before I show you more pictures here. So the, the PE character variety is not the only possible way of constructing SL2R representations. So let me just uh, state this result. So okay, so here M is a Z homology sphere. And uh, suppose that the the trace field of M has a real place. Uh, then, um, well, I guess you can say it this way. Um, the, the proof is more relevant to the picture, but let me just say uh, for all sufficiently large positive numbers p and q, um, either m p over q or, well, um, either the set of all p over q fillings or it's a not, it's a homology three sphere with torus boundary. Oh, let's say it's a not complement in a homology three sphere. Yeah. Um, so what happens is that either the uh, positive slopes or the negative slopes um, are orderable. And the, the reason is that 
when you have uh, the trace field having a real place, you can conjugate your discrete faithful representation so that it uh, has all of the coordinates of the matrices in the trace field. And then you can uh, re-embed the trace field using the real place to get a curve which is sort of a Galois conjugate of the sort of geometric component of the character variety. But on that, on that curve, so on that curve you still have the trace functions of meridian and longitude being coordinates and so on. But um, the discrete faithful representation has been replaced by a real representation. And so in a, if you look at the conjugation action there, you're going to see a little arc of SL2, well, of real representations, but they, they can't be SU2 because they're close to a parabolic. So, um, here is such an arc. So, this is a parabolic representation which corresponds to this real representation, and then there's the arc of SL2R representations nearby. And so, all of the slopes in this quadrant are going to admit actions on the circle. Okay, so let me just uh, show you a couple more and then I'll stop. Um, so they can be fairly complicated even with not too complicated manifolds. This is a seven tetrahedron manifold and um, you can see all those real places <laughs> and you can see all of those roots of unimodular roots of the Alexander polynomial and all of these SL2R representations that are going to give you action. Uh, of course, what you'd like to see if you were going to prove the conjecture by this method is you'd like to see that you're getting all the slopes from plus infinity to 2G to minus 2G minus 1, the negative of that. And that doesn't happen. Uh, you get up to 76, but the genus is 47. So there is a gap there. Um, and other weird things can happen. So here's an example. Um, let's see, just so I don't forget. Oh, um, well, we do know, but I don't know right now. We can look it up. Um, I mean, I'm, we probably know. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, this is an interesting example, I guess, just because it has uh, an arc like this, which is an arc going from a reducible representation to a parabolic representation. Um, but then there are these sort of nice kinds of arcs like we like to see, which give you slopes from infinity, well, in this case, though, to not enough, but uh, a range of slopes going out to infinity as well. Um, here, uh, this is an example where this, so this is a purple dot, if you can tell that, not a red dot. Purple dots mean that the root is a multiple root of the Alexander polynomial. And it obviously looks like a multiple root because this curve is tangent to the green line, but we can't explain that. <laughs> uh, it seems to happen. Um, here's an example where, um, well, something like this is occurring. So you have uh, an arc of representations that starts and ends at a parabolic. They don't always go from reducible to parabolic, unfortunately, but there are many that do in this case, and some of them occur from real places and some of them don't. Um, here's one where there's nothing else besides those. Um, so I guess uh, to explain this, so you the, the lines which pass through this interval here um, give you um, orderable groups, but also the lines which pass through all the translates of this interval, so you get a whole range of values. 
And then on the other side, lines that hit this curve go from minus infinity to something. Uh, and then just Uh, just a sobering reminder that this isn't going to be good enough. So here you don't even get all the way to plus infinity or minus infinity. And um, this one we just like the picture. So I guess the main, uh, yeah, so uh, what else should we say here? Um, one thing that clearly seems to be missing from all this is that we need better ways of constructing actions on the circle than just using representations. It's not going to be enough. Uh, and uh, there's one more uh, sort of phenomenon that I didn't quite have time to talk about. But in the situation where you get the x representations, well, for the for a lot of knots, there are uh, components of the character variety where there's a constant trace function. So that means when you do the Dane filling in that direction, um, you know, you're, you're seeing a closed manifold which has actually deformable representations. As far as we know, that always happens because there's an essential torus in that closed manifold and you're doing the bending construction. And we can prove some things about those bending curves, uh, namely that the corresponding root of the Alexander polynomial is either multiple or a root of unity. Um, and that's, that was, that's important for the theorem. Uh, one, of our essential, one of our inessential hypotheses rules out the possibility that the longitude has constant trace function. So the longitude always has a, yeah, the longitude has a pole <laughs> under our hypothesis, so can't have constant trace function. And uh, there are examples like the knot 8-5 where there is a component where the longitude has constant trace function, so the arcs that we get don't actually intersect any of the lines. Uh, so I guess uh, maybe that's it.